itself. So I wanted to show this um, because we can't, we can't bring an appliance in and I don't want to, didn't want to bore you guys for an hour as we waited for it to boot up and answer a few questions and go. So we used a few, uh, few screen captures to kind of showcase when we have the three nodes, what essentially is happening here is we are bare booting the servers from the Commvault provided image. And this is basically similar on the uh, reference architecture or even on our appliance. Uh, the only difference on the appliance is obviously the image is preloaded, set, ready to go once you power it on. From that point, you're basically doing the boot, you're answering a couple of questions on how you want to configure your network. Uh, it's obviously installing the OS, setting things up, discovering the disks, aligning the different volumes, making sure it's set up in the way that, that we want the actual hardware to be defined. The wizard kicks in for how you want to answer your network calls, how you're going to configure and register in, into your Commvault configuration, define what the disk library is, set up the DDoP policies, have a basic default setting for a, uh, a basic plan for an SLA, and you're basically ready now to do deployment. In fact, when you first launch into Commvault, and something you guys will see here from us today, the Java interface is old. We don't use that as much anymore. It's still there. If good Commvault faithful want to still use Java, it's all there. It's the new admin console. It's the first thing that launches up that really simplifies attaching, deploying, and starting to drive the, the protection um, execution for our customers. We're going to showcase that fairly heavily here just in a good, couple seconds. We hate Java almost as much as we hate Flash. <laughs> and for many of the same reasons. So we'll go into a little bit more details now on what's under the covers as we talk about the appliance. And this is what the bezels look like. And you guys can read the text basically explaining what scale out on x86 server infrastructure is. It is 3U. Uh, so it's meant for sort of the remote site enterprise or a, a, a smaller customer data center environment. Obviously, we're going multi-petabytes. We want to push them because economically, you know, cooling, power, all of that makes a lot more yeah, sense in a denser server. You said this is 3U? This is 3U, correct. So, it's each so I can't add a fourth node? Uh, what you would do is you would add three more nodes for more capacity. That allows us to continue the scaling out the brick. So the step or, function is three nodes? This is three nodes for the appliance. So when you buy the appliance, the, the, the block of servers that we have here is three, no, three nodes, three servers. And then when you buy, if you want to expand that, you buy another appliance and it expands to another three nodes. And, and I'm, you I'm assuming capacity. we're Like I said, on, the step function is three nodes. Three nodes, correct. And I'm assuming we're licensed on, the, on an appliance total number of appliances and storage. So the licensing on this has changed to back in terabytes. So whatever back in terabytes you can throw at it, however well the deduplication occurs and works for you, that's what you're essentially licensed for. It also gives you extensibility into the cloud. Uh, and of course, it gives you all the, the, the data protection options for databases and file systems and virtual machines, et cetera. And you're basically buying the one SKU based upon the actual back in terabyte capacity of that appliance. So at the heart of it, I think this is what you guys wanted to get to. So what's the minimum? Um, capacity of a node. So let me jump forward and I'll show that and we'll come back to this. The way that our, uh, our appliances are built, so they are, they are Fujitsu 1U 24, 2530 servers, I believe? 2510. 2510s, okay, thank you, sorry. They're 1U <coughs> servers under the cover, so they have slots for essentially uh, four SAS drives and we have the one, um, or there's two, isn't there? There's one for boot and one dev base. Yeah, for right, right, so, so basically the two terabytes of, uh, of flash. The usable capacity, as you can see, from 4 to 10 on, and that's, that, by the way, is, uh, is, is base 10, not base 2. So 32, obviously, you subtract, what, 0 0.9094, whatever percent, and you get the actual usable capacity there. Um, but that is what you have minimum at 32 across those three nodes using 4 terabyte drives, and the maximum in 10 terabyte in the appliance is at 80. You want bigger than that, you go with the Cisco. You want larger than that, it, oh, it makes financial sense to go with a reference architecture design of a 12 or 24U chassis. And not just from storage, but like I say, power cooling, you name it. Okay. So that's kind of the, the configuration. Erasure coding, as you can see, it cuts the usable a by a third. So you know, you're, you're losing, using that, losing that for resiliency. What's internal here, if you look at this. Count compression or deduplication no. or any of those stuff. So this is raw capacity. Raw capacity. Effective. You got it. So the deduplication, compression, all that comes from the Commvault software. And that's, as you guys know, deduplication, I mean, it all depends upon how much your data changes and how you're layering it. Uh, most dedupe do algorithms that. are about the same. So we're not going to have the deduplication algorithm or deduplication ratio uh, conversation. No need to do that. Um, in the appliance, the one different piece is, is we do have RHEV running in this. So it's cluster. And, and, the, and the metadata is replicated across all three nodes? Is that how this works? That's correct. correct. It's an SSD. SSD, that's correct. So if you look at this, cluster, drive, storage pool, three nodes, they're all media agents. SSD drives all linked together. There are internal interconnects for how we keep that information readily available across those different nodes. 
Um, and then, of course, you have the virtual machine, if you need it, to run the actual comm serve. So when we talk about this, if you're a current customer and you just you need more, you need new storage, and you're in this capacity range, you can just go ahead and buy the appliance, and we don't have to turn on that uh, uh, the comm serve piece. So if you're and, supporting NFS in the front end of this, where's the inode directory structures and that sort of stuff? Is that sitting mm -hmm. on SSD or is that on this? On the fly. SSD. That's on the SSD on the fly. Yeah. To, to Glenn's it's point. Translation, right? They're yeah. doing it kind of on the fly when you ask for it. So when we say NFS, it's not meant to be your files. home oh, drive I, file yeah. system. Yeah, providing no, temporary I, access. I don't wanna, yeah. Not 10,000 user home directory. Yeah, access. this is meant to be for you know the point in time access and we'll generate it on the fly, get access to the information, put it there, make sure it's indexed and now following through on the actual data management components underneath. So when you take that setup, one use server, four SAS drives, one SSD drive, and as you can see, the uh, com vault and the hosted engine for how we're driving the master server is stored in Gluster going through our HEV. XFS for the DDB indexes, that's going across the solid state disks. Going back to, to Ray's NFS question, I think he's a little, so, so would one of the use cases for that specific NFS, the way you guys do it would be for creating a NFS data store to connect to, to restore, to immediately restore a VM and then storage remotion it? There's one option. Is that a use case for that particular NFS purpose? Another one would be, let's say you're running uh, Oracle backups, and for whatever reason, you don't want to put any intelligence on that Oracle system. You just want to simply write that Oracle DB dump. Oh, you mean I'm a DBA? Directly to, oh, with that. Yeah. yeah, you're a DBA. Directly to our system, we can do that. that so, mean, oh, you said that would mean you're a DBA, yeah. <laughs> so, file version of this? Uh, so, hmm. at the end of the day, you could run this in the cloud, our viewpoint of this, and this is a conversation actually I had with, uh, I think, Justin two weeks ago, you could run this in the cloud. But you'd run up a heck of an EBS bill. Exactly. Yes. And not only that, but because we can integrate with all four layers of Google's cloud platform, all four, five-ish, whatever you want to call the different layers of AWS, we integrate directly. <coughs> same thing with Microsoft, same thing with Oracle and Bare Metal. And the question then is, okay, why would I run this in the cloud if I can already use their scale-out object and, and uh, storage-based services natively with compression, with deduplication, with the ability to do the provisioning and orchestration, this is actually allowing us to take those sort of ideas and now put them back on premises for, like, for a customer so they can have similar scale-out capabilities to what they can see in the cloud. So when I say run this in a cloud version of this, that's a very good point. So I don't want to run servers in the cloud, period. Correct. So I want this service. I want this service, and but blocked with backed with S3 uh, object storage. You got it. That presents NFS to cloud-based systems. So if I want to move data from uh, production to take a copy of that data that's running in a uh, Commvault based solution yep. that is backed by S3 storage, but presented to by via NFS to EC2 instances running QA version of my software. Yep. I'm assuming that's, that you guys have that so, so what we, solution. Yeah, what we, what we would need, you would still have to spin up a server. And here's where the orchestration stuff that we do is, is, is so important. We will provision and spin up that server the moment you want that data back. We'll drive the actual access from the S3 directly back to the EBS storage that you require. When that process is done, we will then power down and spin down that data mover so it's no longer sitting active. So you now have your data refreshed, the whole processing of getting it from cloud storage back into a live compute environment is all orchestrated from what it takes from an Yeah, that, that's service. interesting. That's not what I want, but that's interesting. Yeah. What, I want is, <laughs> what, I, what, what I want is a, a data provider in the cloud. Well, I want a NFS data provider in the cloud for object storage back in that has my original data set. So when I want to hydrate the data, the uh, Commvault has a, it can be an EC2 uh, data provider that hydrates the data and provides that proxy between S3 and my other EC2 instances. Mm -hmm. So I'm not thinking about using it as VR, I'm talking about using this as so that, if that's what yeah. you described, that, 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 that's that exactly exists. what we're describing. So when you say restore, you bring up the instance in the cloud. So you mean the instance that you're bringing up is that data? The data provider. instance, yeah, okay. the data mover piece. Okay. We're going to fire that up, provision it. That's our media agent technology, the data mover technology okay. that knows how to speak to the S3, 
with, our, with the data that we've stored and move it right to whatever it is that you need? Then I apologize. That is what I want. Okay, cool. <coughs> okay. Right. Give me a reminder on where you got, what, what you guys do for rapid VM recovery. Well, ah, we'll, do, we'll cover that in the next section, and we'll okay. show an example of it. I can okay. wait. Yep, good. Yeah. Contrary, contrary to That's popular belief. <laughs> you can wait. So we've talked about most of this already. Um, I believe you guys will all have slides and access to this, and there'll obviously be a recording. Um, the few things I want to point out here is on the bottom on the easy to buy, on the appliance side, if a customer buys an appliance, this is primarily driven through a subscription pricing to match the actual uh, depreciation of the actual server hardware with the software itself. So at the end of that three-year subscription, subscription, if you decide you continue, want to continue on with the solution, we'll go ahead and, and refresh the hardware for you. And you just keep doing the subscription for the capacity you need. So, so even in the appliance, they're not actually only, buying the hardware. Only the appliance. They're, they're Purchasing a subscription. Subscription. And we're giving them the or appliance. Back a terabyte. Back terabyte. Or a backup terabytes. You got it. And then because it's scale out, they'll have the ability to swap in and out the different nodes and components as they need. We'll do the auto leveling, make it as seamless as possible and, that they can bring in that new hardware. And that subscription activity, how does a customer determine whether they need more or less you know, nodes? Uh, is it based on the raw terabytes? I mean, so let's say the performance is not adequate to do my backup in the backup window. Sure. And they paid for the subscription to do you know, a petabyte of storage backup. So well, how does that happen then? Well, I guess um, let's talk capacity and performance is a bit harder conversation to, to touch into, right? Um, you know, Performance-wise, there's a number of ways you can solve that challenge. But in the subscription uh, contract, is the performance specified or is it just a back end? It's, back based, on ba it's based on back, back end terabytes. terabytes yeah. right. We don't really talk about performance on so that's you're expecting X terabytes an hour. Because that's, that's give and take based on the customer environment as well. Like if, I can only, if I can only read data at 10 gigs a, uh, or 10 megs a second off a of production storage array, that's all I can read data. I can't move it any faster or different outside of maybe thinking of ways it's being replicated or, or integrated with, right? So that's why we focus on the back end terabytes, and that's why the suite of, of capabilities that we have that basically attach to what we're doing on hyperscale is so important for the customer. So they okay. can make as efficient usage of that back end yes. capacity with whatever performance metric deems appropriate for them. And when, you're, when you're talking about back-end terabytes, you're talking about data written, right? That's, that's correct. So the, the available usable storage, that back-end terabytes is essentially what you're licensing. Right. So you can, no, that's, that's, not, that, that's the other way to do it. So, <clears throat> you're, so you can either charge for back-end terabytes in terms of data written or in terms of data of Storage space presented to the backup application. I got gotcha. you. Storage and, space and if I <coughs> storage space presented to the backup application. So, so it, it's okay. So now so I you have. If you deduplicate a million to one, and you can keep deduping a million to one, and you don't use up the hundred terabytes of available space, keep on at it. We don't care how much data you throw at it. Okay, keep but but I good. can but I can build a system according to your reference architectures, and use the Gluster storage for my short term data. Correct. And then shovel it off to S3 or my in-house S3 object store, which essentially has unlimited data and therefore you can bill me an unlimited amount of money. But at that point, it wouldn't be our appliance. You're now paying for yeah. that capacity. I well, just saw Convol stock price increase. So, <laughs> I, so now I'm just completely confused about your licensing models, so it, it, which puts me in company with millions of other so people. So I'm not a little bit, but the fact that I don't mind interrupting the Howard, Ray, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Come the closer. question <laughs> on, question on uh, what happens to data, go back to a basic data question. So mm -hmm. I can present NFS via Commvault to a solution and I make a write to that data. What happens to that data? How do I protect that data? So that's a great question. So by presenting NFS for Commvault, mm -hmm. we basically do all of that presentation layer on the fly on demand. Right. That's why we say it's not meant to be your file server. Right. Once you do that, that data lands on that section of our platform. It now is essentially in our data platform. We actually now use our, use our, our data movement intelligence to index it, understand the actual put command that you use in our API system to get it there. That becomes part of the metadata, so we know the system it came from, who did it, a number of other different pieces. Mm -hmm. It also, usually in that command, assuming you define it, will define its retention yeah, and where it awesome. needs to live 
and what copy it goes to. Okay. So if so it goes to hyper now it becomes just another uh, it's just another set of meta, data meta, bits meta, meta data, then and then once I destroy that once once I make that unavailable, but that that metadata still exists and I can make recoveries from Correct. data any data that was written. That it's was almost like you have a per, like a persistently open backup job that you're writing into, mm -hmm. and then when you're done, it closes and that was the backup job's done and then. All the other Commvault stuff just happens, right? This yeah, is well, it's going to be the Oracle DBA who insists on using Rack. And so, so back and to my the question use about the for NFS and oh, yeah. our object store. Yeah. Back to my question here. So, if the performance is not adequate and the cur the customer has purchased whatever the backend terabytes are subscription, do you go in and, and upgrade the servers for them, or how does that work? I mean, well, I mean, it goes back to performance not being adequate. Um, we would work with the customer to ensure we make it adequate. So we've got, I mean, the throughput numbers that we're seeing on our hyperscale, I mean, it's, you've done some of the work on that. Basically, where do we stand on throughput numbers? We're in. Or are you talking dedupe or raw? Give them both. Okay, so uh, I mean, we can, we're, a lot of the Mic focus up. that we've been focusing with the. Mic up. Thank you. A lot of the performance that we've been focusing on with hyperscale is more about recovery performance than the actual protection speed. We're banking on the fact that we're going to be wanting to use incremental forever dedupe technology so that after we outline that baseline, I really don't have to worry about that component all the time of the data that I'm actually writing, right? If I'm, you know, getting that 98% deduplication rate, if I'm protecting, you know, you know, fast enough. I guess my concern is to some extent, you know, if, if you know, if I buy 10 terabytes of backup, and I don't know what the right number is, and, and, and I determine that I can't back up my stuff in the, in the amount of time I have available, you know, what, what's the solution to the customer from that perspective? You go in, you add more servers, that's one approach, because they bought a subscription, though, for 10 terabytes, that's going to come with another 10, you know, 5, ter whatever, 16 terabytes associated with it. So I think the point is, is that it's not going to be the nodes that are going to be the problem. It's going to be how we're trying to get the data there. So. If you're not able to meet a backup window for so whatever you So I don't think the performance will ever be your nodes. The performance bottleneck will be the nodes perspective. It'll be, it'll yeah, be the, the host so environment. I agree it, with you. you. I, I have the same challenge. So, con, and I think this is more of a contract, contractual, con, contractual question than it is a technical question. What happens if the nodes themselves become the bottleneck in performance? What is my recourse as a customer? Let's, <laughs> let's, let's, we don't even have to have the technical conversation. Yeah, sure. It's just what happens if. Sure. I, I think that's what we've done on our testing to try to make sure that doesn't, that's not the case. But if that is the case, um, I'm not sure we have a great answer for what that means today contractually. At least it's not, not from my, my perspective on what that answer would be. The, the bad answer is buy more? The bad answer would be buy more, correct. Okay. But I'm, I'm sure we would work with our customers to figure out, okay, why are we not performing? I'll, I'll take that one offline. We've got... Uh, good, I'm on. I'll take that one offline. We actually have our appliance team here, so I'll bring that up. Deepak's just writing a note, yep. so I'll follow up on that one for you. It's a great thing if you want to bring up while we're on the show floor, like I say, with the, yeah. the product guys, the experts, and even some of the program owners. Be a great question to ask them if you guys are, are here throughout the show. And part of that would be to understand how likely it is as well. Correct. Because if it's a, okay, yeah, it's theoretically a problem for four customers in the world. I don't really need to care. Where if it's, it's something like, well, actually, this is there, it depends. Question. Yep. Like, okay, maybe that's something I will need to factor in. I need to do something about that in my proof of concept. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking eighty terabytes an hour, is that that was the ROM number or was that the dedupe number? That was the dedupe number. Yeah, eighty terabytes an hour dedupe number across three nodes. Okay, so that's pretty yep. darn good performance. And we've got a number of other tricks that we could throw at it to help improve how we're moving data with all the technologies okay, now built in the Commvault suite. Now you're making me ask the question, how much am I paying for those three nodes in dollars? Can I, let me ask a question of that, uh, to, that follows up out of that. Is the, I want to ask about the, the financial st structure of this. And I know this is not a technical question, so I apologize. But is this something that Commvault is fronting the cost of the hardware? Are you going through a leasing company and then as a customer, I'm really doing a back-end lease? No. Or is this truly an operational expense that I'm yep. going to incur? Yes. This is truly an operational expense. That's good. Yes. Okay. So we are, we, we are bringing the appliance in. We are doing the work. We are working with, the, with Fujitsu to get access and, and own the servers, providing that inventory, giving that to our customers across our channel, across the globe as they're bought. That's oh. an operational expense on us. This brings up, that's a great question. Now this goes back to my security question. Now I'm applying packages to a device that I don't own. And that, the, operationally, that causes problems. When I have a, uh, an appliance model in my data center, and I don't own the- You don't have to. Go, go use the Cisco one. 
I, I, Use the Cisco I, one. Yeah, Problem solved. That's, that's where the reference architecture makes more sense then as well. Can you buy this outright if you want to? Yeah. That solves your okay. problem. That's you can buy the appliances? Yeah. From you? The appliances are available today from us, from our partners. Oh, right. oh so it wasn't just you subscription. Don't have to buy, you, you can don't buy have these to also. The operational pay as you go thing. You can, you, buy, you can buy the. Oh, no. The, well, the, the licensing for it is subscription based for how you leverage the software and the appliances together. But you buy. So you want to buy them perpetually is what you want, is what you're saying. Yeah, it, this has the option. goes into big organization politics. You guys are running to, we, yeah, we don't yeah. have to have a, the, there's a problem with, if I don't own the appliance, why am I patching it? That should be a managed service with the appliance. If, the, if, it's, if it's truly a service, I, I'm not responsible for patching and maintaining the OS. <coughs> that's someone else, and th that's a long discussion. And that's well, and essentially what we're trying to do with the appliance and the whole program, right, to make sure that, that we're driving and managing that through our Commvault software updates that has its own automated update pro mm -hmm. uh, platform and program for anything that becomes critical. Well, that also, I mean, the whole subscription model also opens the door to and what happens at the end of the subscription. Yeah. You know, you're going to take the appliance with my data on it back? Oh, hell no. Or even the the whole thing, nothing leaves my data center without me putting a bullet through the. You can always. For the, you the, can the, no, no, nothing without me putting a drill through the uh, hard drive. That, you, can you can always you, know you can I always look at it in a, in, a, in a different aspect versus the negative, but also the positive. That also incents us as a as a as a vendor to make sure that we want you to <clears> renew. <throat> we want to keep that going forward. We want to earn your business oh, every single We're time over and over. Yeah. 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 And, and plus, the reference architecture solves this problem, too. Yes. True. yes. Yeah. True. And, and remember, too, if we go on to, to where we're trying to focus the appliance, again, that's meant to be more of a remote site, just ship it, power it on, manage it remotely, and you're done. You don't have to worry about it. And then use the large reference architecture for those things to pool in as you're trying to maybe centralize your data sets or you, know, you have a larger data requirement. They can all work together underneath one implementation of Cobalt. Okay. And, and you do appliance to appliance, wide area replication Without all, rehydrating the data. All part of it. So it can be deduplicated from point A to point B and basically make the same exact copies as, as efficiently and intelligently as possible. Yep. Correct. Guys, I have a question. From a management perspective, how does it work? Because, for, for example, where I work, uh, we have a massively distributed organization, global, and we, I can imagine many islands and single points of management. Do you have something global to take care of that? And on a broader context, uh, is the duplication kind of related only to that little island, or is it kind of leveraging everything? Yeah, so good question. The deduplication is focused on the nodes or the, the pool that you're, that you're building, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have two appliances or a reference architecture and appliance or multiple reference architecture builds, the deduplication lives within those nodes, OK? So you, you won't have a wide area deduplication. It's not going to work that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this goes back to his Commvault scaled out conversation that occurred first. And the interesting thing is, yeah, you, if, you, if you were a large distributed organization globally, right, main headquarters maybe here in DC, and then across the globe, you've got remote hubs and offices. That's kind of the, the, the beauty of how Commvault was initially designed. And I think oftentimes kind of get, gets lost in the conversation of technology change. Um, we've got ourselves set up where we have one central, you know, master or control node that can run globally. And the main reason it does is because the way we've distributed out the way indexing and job control functions work so that we never need this massive or thick pipe of communication back to keep everything working. In fact, in some cases, we can lose complete communication and still allow operations to run autonomously while we wait for that WAN link to come back or internet, internet link to come back and still manage them all centrally. And so because of that distributed nature of how our software works, it's scale out or scalable for going across the globe, and then also means that we can add in all these different you know, scale out repositories across the globe as well, because they're then essentially all managed separately as one centralized roll up on how policies define the availability of the data, uh, how retention is driven, how you're using cloud, and you can even become granular and, and really kind of drive that IT as a service in that same facet, because I could give you rights to one site, you rights to another site, him rights to another, and have three people that <coughs> run the whole thing. And now you're starting to disperse out those operational needs. So that's been sort of our heritage of what yeah. we've been. And this whole scale out platform just means it's easier for our customers to get that lower cost storage and start making it easier to replace that infrastructure, kind of in that, that, that cattle mentality versus the rebuild, forklift, something fresh every time you have to get to new technology. All right. So five key values, flexibility. Obviously, the power of Commvault really makes that scale out really, really seeing 
We're trying to eliminate the complexity by giving everything as one in the solution. The availability is improved because we're getting away from RAID, moving towards erasure coding, making it easier to swap out different parts and components. Can you go back one slide? Yep. So on site next business day, parts replacement. Yep. So that will mean that if I have the, what was it, the 4.2, and I lose one drive, mm -hmm. um, Monday morning at 8 a.m. <coughs> um, when will I have the next drive or? So, wor so how worst case is next business day. In most cases, it'll happen the same business day depending upon when it occurs. Okay. And it also depends, and the reason we say that is it also depends on where your location is. Uh, you know, if it is uh, somewhere in the middle of Asia Pac, it may be harder for us to get it to you there at the same day. If it's somewhere in North America, somewhere in the middle of, of, of EMEA, it may be faster and, and easier to get that to you. Um, but it, being that Fujitsu is who helps us back end our appliance on the actual hardware, we then work with some of their business partners for making that delivery service of their components also available for this appliance. Okay. Okay. Cool. So we just, I think you guys understand how this works. I don't know if you want to see, we'll just let the, let the automation play out on what 4 plus 2 basically means. Yeah, we, we, we rock originally.